Today, sharks are the biggest, baddest things in the ocean, but it wasn't always that way. Today, I'm going to be talking about the entire evolutionary history of sharks, which is surprisingly long, and their journey to becoming the apex predators that they are today. So the reason I'm making this video is because I relatively recently made a video about Mesozoic marine reptiles, or the sea monsters of the past. Um, they were quite sea monster-like. I'll link the video up here if you want to check it out later. But in any case, I got a comment on that video asking, what about sharks? <laughs> Where were sharks at this time? Had they evolved by this time? Spoiler alert, yes they had, and if so, where did they lie on the food chain relative to these marine reptiles or sea monsters? Well, to tell this story, I must start with the thing that sharks are, which is fish. So how did we get fish? Well, fish first appeared in the Cambrian period around 530 million years ago, kind of during the time of the Cambrian explosion and that really rapid diversification of animal life at the beginning of this eon. But these fish were definitely not shark-like fish by any means in the Cambrian. They were pretty small, typically less than a foot or about a third of a meter, and most organisms at the time were pretty small. I talk in another recent video about the quote-unquote first apex predators in animal ecosystems being the anomal carids. And while these guys were relatively big compared to the other smaller and softer bodied organisms of their time, they would likely not be apex predators if we just stuffed them into the modern ocean. So things looked a lot different back then. A lot more primitive, a lot more soft bodied. Skeletons were evolving and rapidly diversifying, but things were very much smaller, still very heavily microbial, and, you know, getting more diverse and larger, but it was taking a little time. So it wasn't until after the Cambrian in the Ordovician period around 500 million years ago that armored fish evolved. Still very much not shark-like yet, but this was a major step forward. These ostracoderms likely ate microbes, algae, organic debris, and maybe other small, soft-bodied organisms like worms and soft arthropods that didn't have any hard skeletons. At this time, the anomalocarids, as I showed on the previous slide, had gone extinct, but there were new arthropod predators during the Ordovician called Eurypterids. And we nicknamed these guys sea scorpions because they kind of look like sea scorpions. So still throughout the Cambrian and Ordovician, we were in a time of mainly arthropods being the predators and fish being kind of small, you know, they, they ate some small organisms, but they weren't like actively hunting the biggest things in the sea like they are today. But this all changed when placoderms came on the scene around 430 million years ago in the Silurian period. These may have not been the first jawed fish, but they were among the first fish with jaws, and the jaws changed a lot of things. For example, they didn't just have to eat soft-bodied organisms anymore, they could go after the crunchy stuff. And jaws actually didn't just take the top place of the food chain, they actually created new levels to the food chain, basically. Placoderms were still armored, just like their ostracoderm cousins, but they had jaws, unlike the ostracoderms, and they got absolutely huge. It's estimated that one type of placoderm, although not all types got this big, one type may have gotten up to 10 meters, and that is 33 feet. So let's just take a moment to imagine 10 meters or 33 feet, and um, yeah, it's freaking huge. <laughs> so these guys were major top predators of their time. Because of their large size and strong jaws, they were able to eat much larger and crunchier prey, even other placoderms. But these are still not sharks. They're fish and they're evolving to become predators. But where were the sharks at this time? Had they evolved yet? Well, there's estimates that say that sharks evolved by about 450 million years ago. But more certain estimates seem to place their appearance around 420 million years ago in the Silurian just after placoderms appeared. Their appearance marked the split between the two main 
groups of fish that are still around today in modern oceans. These two main groups are bony fish and cartilaginous fish. Wow, I said that right on the first time. <laughs> in any case, sharks are cartilaginous fish. That is, they mainly have cartilage rather than bone. And this group of fish today includes things like sharks, rays, skates, and chimera. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, whereas bony fish includes everything else. But the very first sharks in the Silurian around 420 million years ago were still relatively small, typically less than about a meter or three feet. And they were typically not the apex predators in their ecosystems because again, they were coexisting with these huge placoderms. So they were likely more opportunistic predators that ate small fish, small invertebrates, plankton, or organic debris. So really, in the Ordovician and Silurian time, Eurypterids, or the sea scorpions we talked about earlier, which got up to 2.5 meters, or 8 feet, mind you, <laughs> as well as the Placoderms, which got up to 10 meters, or 33 feet, these guys were really the main apex predators of that time. And they continued to play this role throughout the Devonian period, right after the Silurian, which lasted until around 360 million years ago. In fact, the Devonian is often nicknamed the Age of Fish because of placoderm success and diversity and other armored fish success and diversity, as well as some advances of bony fish, which we'll talk about later. Sharks also became more advanced and diverse during the Devonian. But in most ecosystems, they remained inferior to the larger placoderms. However, placoderms and other armored fish like astragoderms weren't so lucky by the end of the Devonian. When the late Devonian mass extinctions hit, which are part of the big five mass extinction events that I've talked about in many of my mass extinction videos that are listed in this graph here, that event took out all of those placoderms and armored fish. Well, there's some papers that suggest that a couple species of these fish straggled on a little bit into later periods, but for the most part, they had gone extinct. Eurypterids didn't go extinct during the late Devonian mass extinctions, but they did greatly decline and then kind of straggled on until the end Permian, but they were no longer anywhere near as successful as they were back before the Devonian extinctions. Sharks, on the other hand, benefited from these extinctions. They didn't go unharmed per se, but after the fact, we had the golden age of sharks or the Carboniferous period begin because of the lack of these other larger species that were preventing their dominance. So just like I've talked about in previous videos, how the dinosaur extinction at the end of the Cretaceous around 65 million years ago allowed mammals to kind of take over terrestrial ecosystems, this was a very similar effect that the late Devonian mass extinctions had on sharks and how it allowed sharks to take over all the newly emptied niches that were no longer occupied by the placoderms and eurypterids. During this golden age of sharks in the Carboniferous period, sharks saw major diversification and some of the species became quite bizarre, as we can see here on the slide. And you may think, no, no way those are real, but remember how odd some of the forms of sharks look in the modern ocean. You know, we still have very odd sharks and shark-like fish today. These bizarre forms from the Carboniferous time are actually chimera, not necessarily true sharks, but as a close relative to sharks, they represent the entire group of cartilaginous fish and how great and sometimes bizarre their diversification was during this time. But modern chimera are much less diverse and typically live in deeper waters. Their upper jaws are fused with their skull and they typically have venomous spines. So overall, during this Carboniferous age of sharks, there was a major shift from big armored awkward swimmers to very rapid streamlined swimmers like sharks. Just for context relative to the modern oceans during this time, there were no marine mammals in the seas at this time. So if you're picturing ocean life, there weren't any whales, there were no dolphins, there were no seals, sea lions. You know, sharks kind of had the whole place to themselves. Well, almost. Let's not forget about the bony fish, that second major group of fish that still exists today. 
Well, sharks and other cartilaginous fish were having their moment to shine in the Carboniferous period, bony fish were also enjoying those relatively newly emptied niches after the Devonian extinctions. So what were the bony fish up to? Well, let's step back a second and talk about what was going on on land at this time. By this time, life on land had begun to take shape. From the Cambrian around 550 million years ago to the Silurian around 420 million years ago, microbes, fungi, plants, and invertebrates like millipedes, insects, scorpions, and the like had begun the move to land. And I talk about, you know, when life moved to land and the series of events that happened in my Life to Land video, which I will link to the top right if you're interested. But by the late Devonian, around 375 million years ago, bony fish, specifically lobe finned fish, which had both gills and lungs, began moving to land. There was a transition from lobe finned fish to a transitional group called Tiktaalik, and then to amphibians. But what does this have to do with sharks? Well, we'll get back to this later. This at the moment was just to give you context as to what was happening around the sharks on land, in the ocean, etc. But I'll talk about in a couple slides why this eventually heavily affected the sharks. So finally, we're past the golden age of sharks, we're past the Carboniferous period, and now we've entered the Permian period. The Permian period, well, the end Permian, marks the largest extinction of the Phanerozoic Eon. That is the largest mass extinction of the last 550-ish million years. It was actually two kind of separate events, but together, because they were very back-to-back -back at the end of Permian, these events took out nearly 96% of all marine life. And yeah, sharks had to endure another mass extinction, but, you know, spoiler alert, they persisted. <laughs> By the early Jurassic period, now we're in the Mesozoic era, the age of dinosaurs, by then, around 195 million years ago, the oldest known group of modern sharks, the six gill sharks, had evolved. And throughout the rest of the Jurassic, all the other modern groups of sharks followed. So the Jurassic was a big time for shark evolution, especially that of the modern groups of sharks, which clearly those groups, you know, they worked for those environments because they stayed the same literally until today. And this was 195 million years ago. So in the last 200 million years, sharks, you know, they haven't stayed fully the same. The groups have diversified and advanced and there's been other groups that have evolved, but you know, most of the major groups of modern sharks evolved at this time and then, you know, just diversified from there. It was at this point that they evolved flexible protruding jaws, which allowed them to eat organisms that were like bigger than, you know, their original small mouth opening. Now they could open it wider and eat bigger prey. They also evolved the ability to swim faster during this time. So they must have been pretty darn apex by this time, right? Well, not so fast. Remember at the beginning of the video, we talked about the sea monsters that roamed in the Mesozoic seas. Well, that was right now. That was here. That was at this time. So yes, sharks were advancing like crazy and diversifying and becoming major, you know, fast swimming and terrifying jaw crunching predators. But so were these other things, like this thing in the picture here, this Mosasaur. Well, that's one of those sea monsters I've been talking about. This brings us back to answering the question from before, that is, why was the move to land so significant for sharks? Well, this is when it hit them. The move of the lobefin fish to land led to the eventual evolution of reptiles. And these land reptiles, yeah, they liked the land and they kind of took it over, but they then also had some groups that broke off and went back into the ocean. And this led to the evolution of those really terrifying sea monster marine reptiles, which were incredibly diverse and dominant, and in some cases quite terrifyingly huge. So during this time in the Mesozoic, sharks were competing with marine reptiles for prey and also were trying not to get eaten by them. There was also some types of swimming dinosaurs like Spinosaurus, so, you know, they had to deal with all these threats and, you know, competition sources. And of course, once again, at the end of the Mesozoic era, which ended with the Cretaceous period around 66 million years ago, they had to endure a fifth 
mass extinction event. Yes, I talk about the big five mass extinction events in a lot of my videos that are listed here on this graph. Well, sharks literally lived through every single one. Well, depending on where you put their origin, if you say that they evolved around 450 million years ago in the Ordovician, then they lived through five big mass extinction events. That is the end Ordovician mass extinctions, the late Devonian mass extinctions, the end Permian mass extinctions, the end Triassic mass extinctions, which I didn't even get into in this video, and the end Cretaceous mass extinctions or KPG event that I'll talk about here in a second. There are other smaller events that were also occurring throughout this time. And I talk about a lot of those in my extinction events nobody talks about video, which I will link up to the top right if you're interested. But in any case, these sharks had to endure so many day extinction events, but it turned out again, kind of helping them because this event took out the non-avian dinosaurs as well as marine reptiles, allowing the sharks to once again take over all the newly empty niches that were around them that the other apex predators in the Mesozoic were previously occupying. But sharks weren't unaffected by this mass extinction event. They in fact did undergo quite large declines, specifically their largest species. The largest shark species had gone extinct and the smaller, more deep water shark species survived. But as we all know, with our favorite ancient shark, Megalodon, it didn't take long for sharks to get huge once again. In the Cenozoic era, our current modern era right now, specifically in the Miocene and Pliocene epochs around 23 to 3-ish million years ago, Megalodon lived, which has been the inspiration for many sci-fi movies and TV shows and documentaries even, which is odd, but trust me guys, he's not still out there. He lived millions of years ago, relatively recently compared to things like dinosaurs, but you know, not today. Megalodon grew to enormous sizes of 25 meters or 82 feet and potentially more. But despite what many people think, Megalodon is not actually directly related to our modern great white sharks. In fact, direct ancestors of the modern great white probably competed with Megalodon during its time. But these ancestors weren't nearly as huge as Megalodon. Again, typically throughout the many extinctions they had to endure, the larger the shark, the more susceptible they were to extinction, at least based on the trends we see throughout their history. So Megalodon was pretty susceptible, even though he was huge and terrifying. And you may have noticed throughout this video that although I have a recent video talking about the incredible longevity of trilobites, which was over 300 million years, Sharks actually beat this by a lot, actually. They've lived for over 420 million years, potentially 450 and counting, and they survived more mass extinction events than trilobites did. So how exactly did they do this? Well, one reason they were able to survive so many mass extinctions, as I've talked about in many videos, is diversity. The more diverse a group of organisms is, obviously the more likely it is that one of those diverse categories of organisms is able to survive the conditions of the mass extinction event. But one major theme that we see throughout the mass extinction events that sharks had to endure, other than the large versus small sizes, is the survival of deep water species and those that have a more generalist diet. I actually have another recent video where I talk about why ammonoids went extinct at the end of Cretaceous and nautiloids didn't. And a lot of the reason is because nautiloids lived in deeper water and their diets were slightly different. So if you wanna check out that video about why deeper water protects against mass extinctions somewhat, I'll link that up here. And if you wanna check out another video where I actually talk about how versatility and diversity really helps the success rate of organisms, I actually have a video where I talk about why dinosaurs were so successful. And I talk a lot about their diversity and versatility in that one, and I'll link it up here. And with that, guys, thank you so much for watching. My references are linked down below as always, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.